Good morning. Good morning to many good friends in the audience. I see Ambassador Hattie Babbitt, my dear friend there, and I see Caroline Croft from the State Department and others. Uh, I'm Jane Harmon, President and CEO of the Wilson Center, and delighted to welcome you um, to this uh, just before the Christmas holiday important event. Uh, the Wilson Center knows a lot about Brazil, and so does our keynote speaker and good friend, Ambassador Tom Shannon. Our Brazil Institute, led by Paulo Sotero, is the premier place in Washington for dialogue on U.S.-Brazil policy. We were first to honor Dilma Rousseff when she became president of Brazil and recently sponsored, along with the Financial Times, the Brazil Economic Conference. We regularly host Brazilian governors and legislators and are a trusted platform to air the good, the bad, and the ugly in our relationship. Tom Shannon qualifies as part of the good. After close to... I hope he's relieved to hear that. After close to four years as the highly regarded U.S. career foreign service ambassador to Brazil, he is back in Washington as senior advisor to Secretary Kerry. There are lots of rumors about his future, dot, dot, dot. To remind, Brazil is the B in BRICS. President Rousseff was also an alleged target of U.S. Uh, surveillance. These issues and more will be addressed, no doubt, by Ambassador Shannon. To introduce him is former Brazil ambassador, U.S. ambassador to Brazil, Tony Harrington, a longtime friend and chair of our Brazil Institute. Before asking Tony to introduce Tom, let me applaud the efforts by Washington and Brasilia to move past the Snowden issues and to reschedule President Rousseff's visit for early next year. Uh, I know a little bit about surveillance issues, and I strongly disagree with what Edward Snowden did. Nonetheless, I welcome uh, the public debate about how we should restart, reset uh, what we do on surveillance. Uh, as the two largest economies and two largest democracies of the Americas, the interests of the U.S. and Brazil are more convergent than divergent in the realms of business, defense, science, education, and culture. As Tom Shannon likes to say, the challenge for the U.S. and Brazilian governments is to catch up and align their policies to this reality. And that's why Tom Shannon is here today, to help us understand the landscape in this hopeful, hopefully post-Snowden era. Uh, let me now turn the program over to uh, Brazil Institute Chair Tony Harrington. Tony ch uh, served as U.S. Ambassador to Brazil in the Clinton administration and is chair of the managing board of the Albright Stone Bridge Group. Welcome, Tony. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Jane, and thank you for the fine leadership that you bring to this important institution here in Washington, the energy and, and reach of uh, the programs under your uh, leadership. I first met uh, Tom Shannon in 1999 when I was uh, unexpectedly preparing to go to Brasilia as U.S. ambassador, not something I had uh, envisioned, but with a mandate from President Clinton uh, to upgrade an important um, and as most of you know, uh, underattended bilateral relationship. Um, happily, I also met this other fellow on the stage, Paolo Sotero, about the same time. Um, two folks who uh, accelerated my appreciation and understanding of uh, Brazil. <coughs> Tom was uh, NSC staff director for Brazil in the Southern Cone, I think, at the time. It was readily apparent to me that uh, Tom was not only highly knowledgeable about Brazil, but uh, had developed an unusual awareness and affection for the country while serving as assistant uh, in a younger age to a prior U.S. ambassador. With Tom's uh, advice and help in particular and that of uh, many others, we were able to conclude um, a lot of significant uh, agreements and open new space in uh, U.S.-Brazil cooperation. Since then, uh, Tom has been a rising star in our foreign service, serving uh, as White House Senior Director and Assistant Secretary of State for the Western Hemisphere, uh, with uh, unneeded, uh, probably unneeded interest on my part in seeing him go to Brazil. 
and uh, frankly with indications, informal indications from uh, the Brazilian government uh, that they would be delighted to see Tom come back to Brazil. He was then nominated and served a w as a distinctly accomplished uh, ambassador to Brazil and as you know uh, returned uh, briefly, uh, well for a while enough to uh, Add a couple of gray hairs, uh, serving uh, as acting undersecretary for political affairs at the request of Secretary Clinton. Um, uh, one, two jobs, one salary, I believe it was. Um, <coughs> last year, uh, Tom was uh, nominated and confirmed by the Senate to the rank of career ambassador, a rare recognition of. Uh, extraordinarily distinguished uh, members of the U.S. Foreign Service uh, given to only 53 uh, diplomats over the last 50 years. And as Jane uh, noted, Secretary Kerry has uh, brought Tom uh, to the inner circle as senior advisor, um, and history continues to unfold. Um, as um, ambassador, Tom was the architect of reapproachment uh, re uh, between the U.S. and Brazil after a period of some malaise in the relationship. Um, in March uh, 2011, less than three months after President Rousseff's inauguration as the first woman president of Brazil, President Obama made an unprecedented early visit to Brasilia. In his address, uh, to a very large uh, congregation in, in Brasilia, President Obama uh, observed that it was high time that Brazil and the U.S. enjoy a level of engagement on a par with that that the U.S. Uh, maintains with China and India, for example. The presidential visit uh, helped reset the relationship. Uh, President Rousseff's uh, openness uh, and engagement with uh, President Obama uh, was clearly an important and constructive uh, step. Then uh, was followed by President Rousseff's visit here in April last year. Interestingly, she set the theme for her visit as uh, Brazil-U.S. strategic partnerships for the 21st century. So agendas were set at the presidential level that <coughs> uh, we need to uh, get on with, so to speak. <clears throat> this kind of mutual high-level outreach would not have happened without the skilled dis diplomacy of our ambassador at work both uh, in Brazil and back home uh, with the state White House and uh, the interconnections. As we know, a further elevation in the Brazil-U.S. relationship was represented by the White House invitation to President Rousseff for a state uh, visit uh, planned for a couple of months ago. Um, the last such visit by Brazilian president, state visit uh, to Washington was more than 18 years ago. All of you are aware of the unfortunate developments that led the two presidents to announce a postponement uh, of the visit, and it's my hope, I'm sure it's all of our hope, that the uh, review by the National Security Agency of the National Security Agency intelligence programs ordered by President Obama will resolve uh, questions that uh, are recognized as legitimate uh, raised in Brazil uh, or otherwise, uh, despite the unfortunate way that they emerged. Um, and that um, uh, in so doing that this will permit uh, rescheduling of the uh, visit and um, moving forward with the relationship. Having uh, tended and paid attention to the relationship uh, since I was ambassador, I believe the reasons that led Obama, President Obama to make the invitation and President Rousseff to accept uh, remain uh, entirely valid and uh, current. Further and deeper engagement is in the interest of um, both governments, uh, the uh, civil societies uh, in both countries, and uh, the business sectors whose interests uh, are remarkably, and policy objectives uh, of the U.S. and Brazil uh, business communities are remarkably the same. I heard these, this uh, confluence of interests can clearly 
stated, reiterated when I was in uh, Brazil last week uh, for uh, the uh, Clinton Go Global Initiative in Rio and then the largest annual conference uh, held by the National Confederation of Industry um, in uh, Brasilia, both occasions addressed by uh, President uh, Rousseff. Um, President Clinton, by the way, not only opened the um, very successful Clinton Global Initiative meetings, um, he was also asked by the National Confederation of Industry to address the uh, body, uh, but he was unfortunately prevented because of his travel um, uh, in connection with the memorial for President uh, Mandela. As a matter of fact, uh, the uh, leadership of CNI told me that it was the largest gathering they'd had, and uh, several people called up saying they just wanted to hear Bill Clinton <laughs> uh, do, his, do his thing. Uh, the awkwardness uh, around the NSA issues uh, uh, in no way diminished the extraordinary achievements um, of uh, the service of our just returned Ambassador Tom Shannon. Uh, and we're fortunate to have him serving with Secretary Kerry generally, um, and where we trust this adept steward of U.S.-Brazil relations will have room uh, for continued attention to realizing the potential for engagement, both bilaterally and the things that we can do together cooperatively on the world stage multilaterally. It's been a personal privilege to work with Tom Shannon for more than a dozen years, as I know it's a pleasure for all of us to have him with us here this morning to share uh, perspectives that are really unique uh, on the state of relations and the future of relations in uh, U.S. Uh, Brazil, uh, and we'll have some time for discussion moderated by uh, Institute, Brazil Institute Director Paolo uh, Sotero as well. Please join me in welcoming Ambassador Tom Shannon. Well, good morning. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, to Jane Harmon, thank you very much for your warm welcome and thank you to the Woodrow Wilson Center. Uh, to Tony Harrington, uh, thank you for your very kind words. Uh, my mother appreciates them. Um, to Paulo Sotero, uh, thank you uh, for the tremendous work you've done here at the Institute. Uh, before we came out here, uh, we were talking about the great work that the Woodrow Wilson Center, and in particular the Brazil Institute, are doing on our larger Western Hemisphere issues. Uh, as many of you know, this is a busy town, and a town with uh, divergent interests and, and a variety of of immediate interests and uh, keeping our, our elected leaders and our thought leaders focused on uh, our larger neighborhood, our own hemisphere, uh, is sometimes a challenge. Uh, but I think the Woodrow Wilson Center and the Brazil, Brazil Institute have done spectacular work. And the fact that you have institutes like the Atlantic Council and the German Marshall Fund expressing interest in the region and trying to establish their own focus, uh, I think, is, is tribute uh, to the richness of, of this field and the importance of it. So I, I personally am, am very grateful for the tremendous work that's done here. So, so thank you, and, and thank you, Paulo, and, and, and thank you, Tony. Um, this was billed as a conversation uh, with me, uh, so I would like to make it a conversation as quickly as possible uh, and open uh, this up to address your interests and, and your concerns. Uh, but before I uh, do that, I wanted to, to say a, a few things, share a, a few thoughts. Uh, as many of you know, I spent nearly four years in Brazil, uh, coming, leaving Brazil in September and coming back here to Washington, <coughs> uh, and have had the good fortune of being asked by Secretary Kerry to work with him on broader issues. So I'm being globalized, uh, but my, my interest in Brazil has not waned, quite the contrary. Um, as Brazil uh, inserts itself even deeper uh, into the world, uh, it will uh, not let me go. And so I will continue to have a, a profound interest in U.S.-Brazil relationships, but especially in the strategic side of that relationship as both Brazil and the United States look for ways uh, to share understandings of the world and to chart cooperative paths that I believe will benefit, benefit both of our countries. Uh, nearly four years ago in February of 2010, actually in January of 2010, 
Uh, I was kindly invited by Paulo to speak here before I went off to Brazil uh, as ambassador. Uh, and, and in that instance, uh, I made a few assertions. Uh, the first was that uh, although Brazil had been described as an emerging power by many analysts, uh, I <coughs> said that I didn't agree with that, that it was not emerging, that in fact it had already emerged uh, and was already exercising uh, a role as an important global player uh, that needed to be recognized and understood. Uh, secondly, I said that, that Brazil's emergence was really the product of its own domestic transformation as it addressed longstanding uh, social inequities like poverty, inequality, and social exclusion, uh, built a, a functioning uh, democracy, and created one of the largest economies in the world, and an economy which uh, was building a large consumer-based middle class that was globalizing uh, as as it developed, uh, and that Brazil's emergence into the world and its assertion of global ambition uh, was putting Brazil in contact with the United States uh, in parts of the world where historically Brazil had not been present before, and that this new uh, engagement with Brazil, whether it be in the Middle East, whether it be in Africa, whether it be in Asia, uh, or more broadly in the Americas, such as in Caribbean and Central America, uh, meant that the United States had to understand Brazil in a different light and that Brazil also had to rethink its relationship with the United States as we looked for a way to accommodate uh, this new global interest. Um, and, and finally, I, I noted that uh, while Brazil and the United States historically have been friendly, uh, there's been a certain polite distance as both of us have gone about our business, but that increasingly we had seen uh, a, uh, more connectivity between our societies and between our peoples uh, that was going to affect ultimately uh, our diplomacy and our foreign policy towards each other, and that with time our societies and our peoples were going to become the principal drivers of our relationship and not our governments. And I would argue that I was right in all of those assertions, uh, and that if anything else, uh, my nearly four years in Brazil have convinced me uh, that they are still valid and actually still very much alive in, in shaping the, the U.S.-Brazil relationship. Um, and uh, although Brazil has seen its, its, uh, its own fair share of, of in internal uh, political effervescence uh, last June with uh, the many demonstrations that we saw across Brazil, uh, from our point of view, this is evidence of the health of Brazilian democracy and the fact that there is broad public space uh, for citizens uh, to, to demonstrate and protest and make their views heard, and that Brazilian institutions have the capacity to respond to them in, in a meaningful way. <coughs> and as we, we look ahead, I think we understand that uh, Brazil's domestic transformation, because it was done within a democratic context and because it was done largely within a market context has shown that democracy and markets can deliver development and that Brazil has also shown that democracy and markets are not about status quo and they're not about protecting privileges. They're about creating space with the right kind of social policy and the right kind of approach to development uh, that uh, the people themselves can have a central role in determining uh, the developmental direction of a country and this is a powerful message. Uh, it's a powerful message uh, from the point of view of the United States, and it's a powerful message from the point of view of countries around the world uh, who are facing challenges that Brazil has faced, whether it's moving from authoritarian government to democratic government, whether it's moving from closed economies to open economies, whether it's moving from autarkic development models to ones of uh, regional integration, um, and whether it's moving from isolation to, to globalization. I think Brazil has, has laid out a a pathway or a, an example of sorts that should be encouraging, uh, not just to the United States as we look for ways to, to influence the world in, in ways that are, are meaningful to us and, and concurrent with our values, um, but also as countries themselves try to, to determine how they can harness the, the peace and stability that democracies and markets can offer to address really significant social uh, challenges and historic social challenges. And so from our point of view, uh, our ability to work with Brazil, our ability to engage with it, uh, not just bilaterally, but globally, <coughs> and to try to shape uh, areas and methods of cooperation, whether it's in uh, uh, foreign assistance, 
in either in agricultural development areas or public health areas, whether it's in promoting nonproliferation, whether it's addressing the peaceful resolution of disputes, or, or fashioning uh, uh, broad trade agreements, uh, how we relate with Brazil and how Brazil relates with us uh, is going to be increasingly important. But as I noted before, uh, one of the, the striking things that has happened uh, over the past several years has been the growing connectivity between our societies and our peoples. And the most evident and dramatic uh, evidence of that, obviously, is, is in tourism, and especially the uh, enormous demand for visas that, that we have seen coming from Brazil, uh, and the flow of, of Brazilian tourists to the United States, uh, and Brazilian students to the United States. Um, over the past 10 years, our visa demand has increased by over 600% and it increased by 32 percent last year, and it continues on an up, up, upward <laughs> swing, even with a Brazilian economy that has slowed considerably uh, and an exchange rate that has declined uh, um, uh, as, as far as the Brazilian consumers and, and tourists are concerned. And this indicates that uh, Brazilian society is globalizing at a fast clip, that the United States still holds significant fascination for, for Brazilians, and that Brazilians are connecting uh, broadly in the United States, whether it be as tourists, whether it be as students, whether it be as investors, or whether it, it, it be as exporters or importers. Mm -hmm. And in, in this regard, I, I think that, that what, what we are seeing increasingly is a response from the United States, a growing interest in Brazil, an increase in tourism, although not at the same level that we're seeing uh, on the Brazilian side, but certainly a dramatic increase uh, in, in business and investment uh, areas. And the, uh, the travel to the U.S. of governors and mayors, state economic development leaders, uh, businesses has been quite remarkable. And we've seen a, a significant increase in our bilateral trade, over $76 billion uh, in goods and well over $100 billion in goods and services. And this is a, a trade potential that is only being barely exploited. In other words, there's a lot more that can and should be done. And the focus of our relationship on, on building out uh, that commercial and investment relationship uh, has been one of the priorities of, of this administration, certainly one of the priorities of Secretary Clinton, and, and remains a priority of, of Secretary Kerry, which he expressed during his visit to, to Brazil. Uh, but what is striking about uh, the, the emergence of, of this new connectivity uh, is that I believe that uh, increasingly our societies will determine the direction of our relationship, and in the process of doing so, uh, both of our governments, by encouraging this, have been building a ballast in the relationship uh, that help us in rough times, similar to saving for a rainy day, by increasing uh, the connectivity between our peoples and, uh, and our society, uh, we are creating a constituency that will demand of our governments to resolve problems that our governments not, might not be either willing or prepared to address uh, in, in the immediate moment. Um, which will bring me, obviously, to the disclosures uh, portion eventually. Uh, but before I get there, you know, the, the, the larger point I wanted to make is, is that as, as we looked at this relationship over the past several years, our purpose was to build what we call the 21st Century Partnership. Uh, that was what I told the press when I arrived in Brasilia in early February. Uh, and it has bec become a ma mantra of the relationship. In fact, it was uh, used as uh, the um, the slogan of, of our relationship when President Rousseff visited uh, the United States uh, the first time. And as we built out this 21st century partnership, as we realized we needed to build uh, a, a much solid and more robust dialogue structure, we also realized that uh, we needed to focus on not just the frequency of dialogue, but also the quality of dialogue. And we needed to connect our governments at ministerial levels and at, at leader levels to ensure that our bureaucracies had clear direction and impetus to move forward on, on issues that were important to us. And we also discovered uh, that as we talked and as we built a, a dialogue around key issues of importance to us, that our points of view converged. This does not mean that they were always the same. In fact, there are some sti still some stark differences. Um, but what was, what was important is that we did find important areas of, of cooperation and concern, whether it be around climate change, whether it be around food security, whether it be around the fight against transnational crime uh, and the proliferation of, of weapons, uh, just to name uh, a few. But as we did this, 
We also recognized that we needed to build a 21st century platform for this relationship. And what I mean by that uh, is that those of you who are real Brazilianists and can remember the good old days know that at one point in time, we had consulates in, in Porto Alegre, in Belo Horizonte, in Belém, in Salvador da Bahia, um, uh, and along with, uh, obviously, our, our embassy in Rio de Janeiro and, and consulates in Sao Paulo and Recife. Um, over time, that had shrunk down to a, an embassy in Brasilia and consulates or consulate generals uh, in uh, Sao Paulo and, and Rio and a consulate in Recife. And if you think about it, um, uh, that structure, having consulates on the coast and having an embassy uh, in Brasilia, would be like trying to cover the United States from Boston, Washington, and Miami with maybe an embassy in Cleveland. Uh, it, it doesn't work, uh, not only diplomatically and, and in terms of our commercial activities, but also in terms of what we're trying to do in our people-to-people -people outreach. Uh, so the, the President's decision you know, to uh, authorize us to open or reopen consulates in Porto Alegre and, and Belo Horizonte was an important first step uh, towards expanding our presence on the ground uh, and to tapping not only into, I think, a very large um, passive uh, population of potential visitors to the United States who just had not been able to travel because they were unwilling to, to travel all the way to the coast or to Brasilia to look for visas, uh, but also expands the, uh, our, our commercial and investment outreach. And it's my hope that over time that we, we will be able to expand our presence uh, even further and build back the kind of, of uh, geographic presence that we need to, to address successfully a, a country of continental proportions uh, like the United States, but also uh, another important component of our 21st century uh, platform uh, is rebuilding our cadre of Brazil experts. Uh, for those of you who follow this, uh, um, Brazil was a, a centerpiece of our hemispheric diplomacy for, for a long time, and because of the many consulates we had in the region, because of our USAID presence and our Peace Corps presence, uh, the U.S. government had a large cadre of Portuguese speakers, a large cadre of Brazilianists who understood the country, who knew it well, uh, who had lived there and sometimes served there for uh, s several iterations, uh, and who the U.S. government could call upon to uh, help it understand what was happening in, in Brazil. Uh, through the 80s and 90s and through attrition, that changed because of the Central American Wars and because of the crisis in the Andes. Much of our hemispheric policy really became Spanish-speaking focused. And because of the, um, the decline in USAID presence, the, uh, the exit of the Peace Corps, and the decline in our geographic presence, uh, we actually began to lose, in the Bureau of Western Hemisphere Affairs, uh, our Portuguese language expertise and, and our Brazilianist expertise. And we ended up drawing upon many of our officers from Angola and Mozambique and Cabo Verde and, and Portugal. Uh, but that has all changed. And it's changed because of the enormous demand for visas, the, the demand that the personnel demands that we have to staff our visa sections, uh, and we now have hundreds of young officers uh, who have done their first and second tours in Brazil, who speak Portuguese, who have traveled throughout the country, who know it well. And as we open uh, new consulates, we're creating new spaces for them to, to travel through the uh, uh, Brazil uh, for several tours. So we're replicating uh, what we had several decades ago, and I think this is going to be very important for our diplomacy because it's going to create not only a familiarity with Brazil, uh, but an understanding of how we need to deal with Brazil over time. And obviously, as, as we look ahead, um, we're, we remain convinced that uh, the United States and Brazil continue to build a strategic partnership and one of, of 21st century proportions. And by strategic partnerships, what I mean is something that goes beyond a transactional relationship which has really defined the U.S.-Brazil relationship for, for so long. In other words, what can either country uh, get from each other? Uh, how things change with a strategic partnership is, is obviously the transactional nature remains to a certain extent. Um, but why it is strategic uh, is because both countries work together to shape common understandings of the world and common understandings of how we are to operate in the world. And this can only be done through the kind of dialogue that we've been building over time. Now, unfortunately, uh, the decision by both presidents to postpone the October state visit was the product of the Snowden disclosures. And this has created a significant challenge in our effort to, to build this type of strategic partnership because it has interrupted uh, a dialogue uh, that was nascent 
uh, but of growing importance and which held huge potential. Uh, I believe that we can recover that moment um, and that we have to recover that moment uh, for the benefit of both countries and not just our governments and not just how our states position themselves in the world, but more importantly for our own citizens as we try to understand how Brazilian investment in the United States and U.S. investment in Brazil and how the connectivity that I talked about earlier can enrich the lives of our citizens and how we can show that our diplomacy has a, relevant, a relevancy to the daily lives of our citizens that really will make it uh, unique in, in our larger diplomatic efforts uh, in the hemisphere and in many ways uh, in the world and underscore the importance of, of what I call social diplomacy. <coughs> Uh, as we've attempted to deal with uh, the disclosures issue, we of course have, have um, engaged with Brazil at several levels, uh, many of which are, are well known. Uh, we engage with them technically, uh, with our intelligence community led by our Director of National Intelligence, James Clapper, uh, meeting with the Brazilian delegation uh, to address their immediate concerns uh, about the disclosures. Uh, there was also um, what we called a, a politi political engagement in which the Minister of Justice traveled uh, to the United States to meet with U.S. officials, including the Vice President of the United States, uh, to express Brazil's political concerns. Uh, and then several conversations and meetings between uh, President Rousseff and President Obama as they tried to sketch out a pathway forward uh, out of this um, challenge in, in, the, in the larger relationship. Uh, and as many of you are aware, yesterday the White House released the results of the presidential review, review group that was investigating the impact of, of technology uh, on information and intelligence gathering, uh, which is really the first step uh, towards a, a larger review uh, of how the United States does signals intelligence uh, and which will ultimately form the basis for us to, to re-engage with the Brazilians and make our own suggestions about the best way forward uh, in that relationship. Uh, as we've done this, uh, the Brazilians have been attentive uh, and have waited with a certain expectation uh, to what we're going to be able to, to offer them and how we're going to be able to move forward uh, in, in the aftermath of, of uh, the disclosures uh, problem and, and challenge. Um, uh, we don't have that clear pathway yet, but we will. Uh, sometime in, in the new year when we finish our larger interagency review and have a chance to take a look at the recommendations that have been issued by the review group up to this point. And I really don't have a whole lot more to say in, in that regard yet because this is, this is a, a work in progress. Um, but it is worth noting that as the United States and Brazil have engaged uh, on disclosures related issues in international forum, whether it be at the UNICEF's, uh, UNICEF's uh, General Assembly in Paris or whether it be in the third committee at the UN General Assembly or the second committee at the UN General Assembly where resolutions related to disclosures have been presented, uh, the United States and Brazil along with our other partners uh, who are interested in things like the internet governance, uh, privacy as a, as a human right and the role of espionage within the structures of international laws and regulations uh, we've been able to fashion texts that the United States uh, has uh, joined consensus on. Uh, and this, I think, is a significant and, and important step because it realizes uh, that, that both of our, our governments uh, uh, have the capability of understanding the concerns of the other and addressing them within a larger international environment where there are many equities at play. Uh, and so um, just yesterday, the UN General Assembly voted on a, a, a resolution that came out of the third committee uh, in which, again, we were able to join, join consensus. And, and I believe that is a, a very positive sign. Uh, we're also um, appreciative of the way in which uh, the Brazilian government has, has handled uh, the most recent communication from Edward Snowden uh, to the Brazilian people and his, uh, his effort to uh, solicit uh, some kind of asylum from Brazil. Uh, the, uh, the response of the Brazilian government is, is noted and welcomed by the United States. Uh, but as, as we look ahead, uh, it's, it's evident that, that uh, what the Snowden disclosures have done, aside from, from creating a level of pause at, at, at one part of our relationship, uh, it has largely not affected uh, this broader people-to-people -people and society, to society engagement. In fact, what we have found both among uh, U.S. businesses and Brazilian businesses 
is a, a deep and abiding hunger to continue uh, our engagement and to continue to look for ways to, to fashion even a, a more fluid and more productive uh, business and, and investment relationship uh, between the two countries. And uh, in this regard, I, I think we have an awful lot to work from. And we continue to see a huge flow of Brazilian students uh, to the United States, uh, which uh, is going to continue to have a big impact on American universities and uh, especially American graduate programs. Uh, because the influx of Brazilian students will really be uh, the largest influx of students from the Western Hemisphere uh, that we have seen so far in the 21st century. Uh, and in that sense, I, I think that the, uh, the impact of Brazilian students on American universities and American graduate programs is, is con going to continue to be large. And of course, as I indicated earlier, the visa demand has not slacked off at all. Quite the contrary. It continues to grow at, a, at an important rate. And, and this, I think, uh, uh, creates a certain urgency uh, for both governments to find a way to, to address uh, the problems and the questions raised by, by the Snowden disclosures. Uh, and, and this is what we are committed to, uh, and we are committed to a larger relationship with Brazil that understands that uh, we occupy different places in the world, that we have, in some instances, different sets of interests, but that ultimately we are committed uh, broadly uh, to interests that are similar and compatible. And as we think about the U.S.-Brazil relationship, it's really worthwhile to take a step back and understand how it fits into a larger international environment. Many of you are familiar uh, with uh, the phrase, the long war, by General John Abizade, uh, who in the aftermath of 9-11 uh, said that while we might walk away from our enemies, our enemies will not walk away from us, and that we need to be prepared to fight them um, whenever they appear and in whatever form they appear. Um, I would argue that although the United States still faces very significant security challenges around the world, and that while we still have enemies who will pursue us wherever we are, uh, we are in a different kind of environment right now. And that in fact, uh, given what we have seen with the rise of China and, and India, the insertion of these giant societies into international economies, the emergence of significant uh, countries such as Brazil, Turkey, South Africa, Nigeria, Mexico, Indonesia, as major regional powers with, with global ambitions, uh, and the emergence of peoples and societies as, as major drivers and definers uh, of so much of our foreign policy and diplomacy, that we are in an, a time and space where while we protect our, our security, we need to understand that our future well-being is all going to be about building partnerships and building alliances, and that this is going to require a new focus and a new energy in our diplomacy, and that while the long war still might be uh, present for us, uh, we, ha we have the immediacy of a long diplomacy that is going to require us to, to, to rethink how we engage in the world and the kind of partnerships we want to build. And in this regard, uh, our relationship with Brazil, I think, can be a bellwether uh, for many reasons that I've already described here. But it's also important to understand that Brazil is a country that has emerged into the world almost entirely through its soft power. Uh, and is part of a larger network of countries that are calling on reform and renewal of international institutions at a time in which there has been no cataclysmic event that forces us uh, into reforming or renewing these, these institutions. <coughs> but a clear recognition that the institutions are becoming increasingly less, less relevant and increasingly less capable of addressing uh, some of the very large problems and concerns that the world faces. And so our ability to, to uh, kind of reestablish momentum in the U.S.-Brazil relationship and to ensure that it gets back on, on the kind of meaningful track that I think both of our governments and our societies want uh, is going to have a big impact on our ability to conduct this kind of long diplomacy. Uh, because ultimately, uh, many, many years from now, as historians look back uh, on this time, uh, much of what we consider to be important will not be seen as important. In <laughs> fact, much of, much of what occupies our, our every day will fall away and become the chaff and dust of, of history. But I think what will be remembered and what will be judged uh, by historians is our ability to accommodate these rising powers, uh, to transform and, and renew uh, the institutions that we have created over time, uh, to be responsive to the larger challenges that the world faces and to do so in ways 
uh, that not only promote international peace and security, but also promote prosperity and the ability of individuals to, to achieve not just um, a, a place for themselves in determining national destiny, but a place for themselves in determining their individual destiny. And this means not only opportunity and resources, uh, but it means an environment uh, in, in which uh, each of us is respected. And I, I believe that the United States and Brazil, because of our broad commitment to democratic values, uh, to human rights, to open societies, uh, are in a unique place to do this. And therefore, there's an urgency uh, for us to, to recapture uh, the, um, the direction and purpose of our relationship. And uh, I hope you all share this. Uh, but uh, I, would, uh, I would like to end there just um, uh, reminding ourselves that uh, this year is the 100th anniversary of the Rondon Roosevelt Scientific Expedition uh, to Brazil, which was so wonderfully captured by Candace Millard in her book, uh, The River of Doubt. Uh, I have a picture in my office uh, of Rondon and Roosevelt uh, standing on the foredeck of a vessel as it sailed up into Mato Grosso, where they debarked and began their land trek uh, to the River of Doubt before they began their, their journey down the river. And it's a remarkable photograph because Rondon is dressed in navy whites with white shoes, uh, his hair slicked back elegantly, uh, erect, head back, chest out, obviously proud of uh, where he was and what he was doing. Roosevelt was dressed um, in camping clothes, um, with his hat off, his hair messed up, his glasses slightly uh, awry, uh, and slightly scrunched and looking at the camera as if he was wondering what was happening. Uh, it was a kind of a remarkable moment in the sense that it, it captured the enormously proud and successful Rondon with a Roosevelt who had seen and done much and still had, had much more to do in his life. But what was striking about that trip, of course, is to have two men of such large egos and large purpose and large experience in life in such close quarters for so long uh, and to have them travel uh, down a river with no hope of ever coming out alive at the end, uh, but just a, a, an anticipation or an expectation that they were on a historic journey that was going to identify a source of the Amazon and accomplish something that was going to be important to Brazil and to the world was quite remarkable. And I believe that in many ways this is an image for a larger U.S.-Brazil relationship that <coughs> recognizes that friendship and courage and purpose uh, can accomplish a lot in this world. So thank you very much. We are going to do now the conversational part of this, and I would like to tell those who are following this on webcast or through C-SPAN that you can send us questions, if you wish, through uh, it's our Twitter account at, at Brazil Institute. Uh, and uh, just before I open for questions and to maybe complete the story that uh, Ambassador Shannon, Sh Shannon just mentioned about the uh, Rondon uh, Roosevelt. That river, the River of Doubt, during the trip was renamed the Roosevelt River. Uh, but the locals, and this is very Brazilian, refer to it to this day as the Teodoro. The Theodore, <laughs> because we treat people by their first name, not their last name. But with that, I would like to invite questions for uh, Ambassador Shannon. Please, I would like you to identify yourselves. Wait for the microphone that uh, Miguel and Carol have. Identify yourself so he knows uh, who is asking the question. Yes, please. Back. Bill Rugel, oh. Mr. Ambassador, it's a pleasure to see you again. Uh, you mentioned, and I totally agree, that the future in the past has been, in a large part, determined by the society. Uh, in order for that to continue, uh, observation, then a question, um, don't we in America f first have to convince our society in relationship to the security issues that we are willing and will modify surveillance so that that can be transmitted to Brazil. Now, however, it's society to society, but in Brazil, of course, the politicians 
do represent the society, and we so ha have to convince them. <laughs> How do we have to convince the society in Brazil first, the politicians, um, and then, of course, there is a, 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 a good section in Brazil, uh, the me media, that is um, skeptical. So how do, we, how do you envision us going about that? That's my question. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. It's, uh, it's a great question. Uh, and you know, one of the challenges of democratic societies, of course, uh, uh, is to create space for the kind of dialogue that we have to have now. And that's one of the reasons the, the president decided to name a presidential review, review group uh, to look specifically uh, at uh, signals intelligence gathering and in, in the impact of, of information technologies. Uh, on the 21st century and, and have a, a space in, in which people could talk about this publicly. <coughs> because one of the challenges always uh, with issues of, of intelligence gathering is that much of it can't be talked about publicly for all the reasons people are familiar with. Uh, and so I, I think the Presidential Review Group has, has done a, a good service in laying out a, a universe of options for the United States uh, that will serve, I think, as a basis for a larger conversation. Uh, as, as far as, as Brazil is concerned, um, you know, we, uh, we have a lot of work to do, obviously, uh, as do the Brazilians themselves. Uh, and, and that's going to have to take place at a variety of levels at the same time. Um, some of this is going to be done between our leaders. Some of this will be done uh, between our diplomats and our in intelligence officers. Uh, but some of this is going to be done uh, more broadly in, in the public sphere. And uh, one of the opportunities that has been presented to us uh, uh, by the disclosures is really an ability to engage with our publics uh, about intelligence work in the 21st century and understand in many ways uh, what informa information technologies mean for us. Um, because um, if you look at the disclosures uh, issue closely, uh, what you really have is a mapping of 21st century technologies and a mapping of the internet. Uh, and a recognition that uh, the way we communicate uh, is changing fundamental understandings that we have about things like privacy and individual agency and our own behavior. Uh, and much of this is not related to intelligence agencies at all. It's related to large companies and how they use bulk data and metadata and how they predict and try to influence how consumers behave. Uh, so, um, uh, in many ways, we've been offered, at the beginning of the 21st century, uh, a window uh, into this century. Uh, and it will allow us, I think, to make some fundamental decisions, not only about how intelligence is gathered, but how we want to structure information uh, in our communities and societies. Paolo, could I just add uh, from a couple of observations from uh, my uh, visit last week, um, meeting with as business leaders and several congressmen, including a very influential senator of the president's party. Um, this is not a representative sampling, but um, uh, the basic theme was we'd like to get on with it, um, you know, get past this. So I think within uh, thought leaders and uh, influential uh, parts of Brazil, there is a desire to move on with the relationship in a constructive manner. Uh, this particular senator had been a part of the uh, delegation that came, uh, met with uh, Vice President Biden, and uh, he uh, was pretty warm about it, including uh, the, Bi the Biden experience where Biden, the pre Vice President, said, um, you know, I grew up with two precepts. One is never trust anyone over 70 and uh, don't trust Washington politicians. I'd like to ask you to trust me uh, and violate both of those. Um, so uh, kind of thing that a exchange, as you know, that a, a Brazilian politician could welcome. And I think there's also an interest in uh, a, a very a great challenge, but an opportunity for collaboration in the evolving uh, uh, scheme of governance of the Internet. Uh, that uh, Brazil and the U.S. Uh, could could be, should be, and probably are prepared to uh, cooperate on. Thank you. <coughs> uh, Claudia. 
Hi, Claudia Trevisan from <coughs> the Brazilian newspaper Estado de São Paulo. Uh, the U.S. government has already said that it's read to discuss a new date for the Brazilian president <coughs> visit to the U.S. I'd like to know if you have, have received any sign from the Brazilian side that they are read to discuss and how likely is that the visit can happen at the beginning of next year. And considering your engagement and involvement with Brazil, like how you personally experienced like the problems that we, how frustrated you were uh, with what happened. <laughs> and yesterday we had a very concrete example of the consequences with the decision of the Brazilian government to buy Swedish jet fights. Like how you saw that, thank you. Okay, well thank you. Um, listen, I, I, I had the pleasure of beginning my tenure in Brazil with uh, WikiLeaks and ending it with Snowden. Uh, so, um, <laughs> what I tell people is, uh, Pogo was right, we have seen the enemy and he is us. Um, however, um, you know, obviously, um, uh, diplomacy uh, and, and representing a country like the United States uh, is not about personal experience. Uh, it's about a responsibility and a duty, uh, not only in this regard to, to President Obama and the United States government, more, but more broadly to the uh, to the people of the United States of America. And it's an enormous honor and, and, and privilege, and so we just try to do the very best we can. Um, I have deep affection for Brazil. Uh, I have deep affection for Brazilians uh, and tremendous respect. I, I think Brazil is a, a great nation that has accomplished great things uh, and that will continue to do so over time. And so I'm you know, deeply committed uh, to the U.S.-Brazil relationship and to building the kind of partnership I, I talked about. And so obviously, you know, finding myself in a, a situation in which uh, we were going to have to, to slow down uh, what we were doing diplomatically uh, or look for other ways to express uh, this partnership uh, uh, was frustrating at, at one level. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, these are challenges that in an odd way we relish because it uh, allows us uh, to, to show what we're capable of. Uh, and, it and it tests our conceptual understandings of, of relationships, and it, and it allows us to, to expand uh, the, the context uh, of our diplomatic activity. Um, in, uh, in, in terms of the decision yesterday uh, uh, related to the FX2, uh, first of all, congratulations uh, to the Swedes, uh, and, uh, and congratulations to the Brazilian Air Force. Uh, this is something that uh, they have wanted for a long time. Uh, and even now it's coming too late, uh, but it's still an important step uh, for, for the Brazilian Air Force. Obviously we're disappointed. Uh, Boeing did tremendous work uh, in Brazil, and it will continue to do tremendous work in Brazil, led by Ambassador Donna Reinach and the great uh, Boeing teams that have, have come down uh, to Brazil. Um, but, uh, but this will not affect, obviously, the kind of cooperation we have, we have developed over time uh, with, with, the Brazilian, with the Brazilian Air Force. Um, but as I, I, I noted, um, and you know, we, we have seen kind of clear signs from the Brazilian government um, that that it is prepared to engage with us in a meaningful way uh, on issues related to disclosures, whether it be in um, international settings, uh, such as I said UNICEF, I meant UNESCO, um, such as UNESCO, and uh, uh, such as uh, the UN General Assembly. Uh, but also uh, its re response to Snowden's request for asylum. So in, in that regard, uh, I, I feel pretty good about, about where we are right now. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, no, listen, this is, a, this is an ongoing discussion we're having. Um, and, you know, um, we've made it very clear that, you know, that, that we're prepared to reschedule. Uh, and so um, I, I, th I, s I still think our conversation uh, with the Brazilians has to ripen a little bit before we we could get a, a response from them. Yes, uh, Julia. Okay, thank you. Um, hello, Julia Swig with the Council on Foreign Relations. Hello, Ambassador Shannon. Um, I, I, I think your opening address and your comments have made an effort to answer the question that I'm gonna ask you again, if you don't mind. Um, I think if we go back, and I'd like to ask you, how do you address the skeptics in this town um, some of them are here, some of them are floating about, who would point to the 
going back just most recently to before your tenure down there to the 2010 Tehran Agreement, then to the reaction even, let's say, to the NSA disclosures, which Germany sort of was greeted, Germans' reaction was greeted with greater understanding than perhaps Brazil was, um, even now perhaps to this choice around Boeing. I think we still have in this town, in some of the bureaucracies that work on regional issues, uh, an, a tendency to understand Brazil um, Brazil's reaction to us as in a kind of a knee-jerk anti-American reaction. And that, that cloud, and even pointing to Brazil's actions on trade issues, on protectionism issues, on patents, whatever, there's a long list of issues that are still pointed to as proof that the United States really can't have the kind of strategic partnership with Brazil that you have advocated for so adeptly. Mm -hmm. So I guess I'd I like you to address that skepticism head on and maybe use a couple of examples even that I didn't mention in Latin America where the r it is pointed to as a place where the United States can't have Brazil as a partner for reasons of how Brazil advances its interests um, that are different from ours. So I'd like you to just sort of poke holes in those arguments, if you could, please. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, li listen, as, as we built this relationship, and relationships obviously are between at least two and sometimes more, um, there were skeptics on, on both sides, and there were skeptics beyond Brazil and the United States. Uh, for all the reasons you described. You know, on the U.S. side, uh, there has always been uh, people who have tended to view Brazil within a South American context uh, and, and tended to view it uh, as a country that uh, has behaved differently than many of our, our partners, that has different kinds of ambitions, uh, and that is uh, sometimes viewed as attempting to limit and frustrate uh, our influence and, and presence, especially in, in South America. Uh, while on the Brazilian side, there have been skeptics who, who wonder, sometimes quite loudly, uh, about the value of Brazil attaching itself too closely to a country like the United States because of what they perceive as the asymmetry uh, in power and interests, and especially the, uh, the, the global reach of the United States and the extent to which Brazil finds itself kind of sucked into our wake and is forced to, to participate in things or act in a way that uh, it does not feel are, are in its best interest over time. And a part of uh, our challenge has been to um, address those skeptics and, and reshape understandings of the relationship, recognizing that um, there's a certain degree of truth on both sides uh, and, and, and that our interests at times do clash and that our ambitions uh, sometimes work at cross purposes, uh, but that, uh, as Jane Harmon noted at the very beginning, that our convergent, the convergent parts of the relationship are, are more important than the divergent parts of the relationship, and, and that we, we have to be able to manage uh, those, those parts of the relationship that are problematic while we try to, to build out and expand those parts of the, of the relationship that, that function well. And, and in, in many ways, the reason I, I talked a bit about the long diplomacy uh, is because this is really the challenge of diplomacy, and, and this is the larger challenge we're going to face with Brazil. I mean, if we are looking for, in Brazil, a country that is going to follow our lead uh, at all times, and if the Brazilians are looking for u from us a country that is prepared to meet its every need when it comes to market access or uh, some other uh, uh, interest it is pursuing, then both sides are going to be disappointed. Uh, and the relationship is going to be troublesome. Um, but if we're able to understand uh, through building common understandings of the world uh, where we can work together in meaningful fashion, uh, then I, I think there's uh, a lot we can do and, and the potential for a, a productive, fruitful, and positive relationship uh, grows and I think uh, it needs to be taken advantage of. Okay, Nelson. I'll go. Have time. Uh, Thank you, Nelson Cunningham. Uh, in my 20 years of daily and weekly engagement with Brazil, which by the way I know in this room is a flash in the pan, uh, there's no one I've found who explains Brazil better to the United States and the United States better to Brazil 
uh, than our moderator, Paolo Sotero. So I don't know if the rules permit this, but no, given that don't. we've heard Tom Shannon's really tour de force side of the, the U.S. side of this, could I ask our moderator, Paolo, what will, the, what will it take for the, from the Brazilian side for us to put this disclosure issue behind us? I think it's a recognition in Brazil of the importance of this relationship, and you can see it coming uh, from the business community that uh, feels that uh, Brazil has, uh, in a sense, somewhat isolated itself in the trade arena, for instance. This is daily news in Brazil. This is part of the national conversation in Brazil, very much so. You had uh, Robson Andrade, the president of the National Confederation of Industries, in a, in a recent speech in Denver, addressing this directly. Uh, Robson Andrade is significantly, is very close to uh, President Dilma Rousseff. He is very close to Fernando Pimentel, uh, who uh, is likely to run for the governorship of the state of Minas Gerais. He's now the minister of development, industry, and commerce in Brazil. So you have this, and you have the signals from society that Brazilian societies want more and more engagement with the United States. Uh, so I think uh, 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 that's where, uh, you know, but this will be, this will uh, uh, appear in a debate in Brazil, especially, I think, in a presidential uh, uh, election year in Brazil next year. It will be interesting. I personally would love if the candidates uh, all have the capacity to engage in this debate in terms of Brazil's uh, presence uh, uh, in the world. Uh, one thing that I thought the ambassador was going to mention, but that he did, and I will. You, know, you have uh, an increasing number of Brazilian companies, global companies. There are about 30 of them, those. And some of them are important import in an important way in the United States. And they become new connectors between, for instance, Brazil and the United States. There is only one company, very well known, Odebrecht, mm -hmm. that has five subsidiaries in the United States. And are here because, well, this is a big market. Uh, this is also a place to, uh, this is a place of innovation. And, uh, and I wanted to conclude, just remember something that President Dilma Rousseff said Exactly one year ago, in her last interview of 2012, she was asked about uh, this business of the, what's the fiscal cliff at that time, that the United States was going down <coughs> because they couldn't manage their uh, fiscal affairs and uh, govern themselves. Well, she said, I don't believe that the United States is losing importance in the world. And this is al almost a quote because I read this so many times. And then she said, the United States is a country with an extraordinarily flexible economy uh, with a great capacity to reinvent itself. The United States is going through a revolution in energy and has something, or oh, is the country of innovation, and has something that uh, she says I value very much and I think we have to pay attention to, and she repeated four times the word education. You know that there is a debate in the United States about the quality of education here, et cetera. But I think those are the topics. Now, uh, what it requires, what, we, what will happen, I just want to think briefly, you know, it takes leadership. It takes leadership here, it takes leadership there to make those interests. Uh, but this was completely out of order because I'm not supposed to be <laughs> saying any of this. Now, uh, Joy, and then I'll move there and I'll come. <coughs> Thank you, Joy Olson from the from WOLA. Um, Ambassador Shannon, it's a pleasure to have you with us. And uh, and it's also it's always such a pleasure just to hear you talk. Uh, you give such Thank a uh, coherent presentation. And um, I know that you cho choose your words very carefully. And so I, I want to address um, uh, this phrase of the disclosure problem, which you referred to uh, rep repeatedly. I think. Um, Probably being one of the only people in the room that's uh, uh, sued the U.S. government for warrantless wiretapping, <laughs> um, and uh, and had our suit actually rejected by the Supreme Court on the grounds that we couldn't prove standing uh, merely about two months before the Snowden disclosures, which uh, leads one to continually wonder if we could have proved standing uh, two months later. Mm -hmm. um, 
Uh, I think this, the, the choosing the phrase, uh, the disclosure problem, makes it seem less serious than I think it really is. Um, because, uh, b and, it, and it's not just on a human rights level and the right to privacy, it's on a commercial level and a political level. And it fundamentally has to do with trust. You know, there is, and, and I understand it's corporate as well as domestic, but I, um, I'd like to hear you respond to that because I do think that it, it discounts the, the seriousness of, of what's happening. And the second is um, uh, with respect to uh, education and the number of, of Brazilian students coming here to the United States, which is enormous. Um, how is it going from the U.S. to Brazil? Because I have a sense that it's much less, and, um, uh, I, I, but I don't know the numbers. And could you talk about that and what you see the future of that on that side? <coughs> I'll, I'll address the last one first. Um, uh, it, it is less. Uh, I don't have the exact figures. Um, uh, but um, but I think that's going to change over time. I mean, uh, to, to begin with, you know, historically, uh, when when Americans have done overseas university stints, uh, it's been focused on Europe, largely the UK, Spain, and Italy, with some France thrown in. Um, but that's starting to change. Uh, we're seeing more Americans going to Mexico. We're seeing more go to Argentina, uh, and it's our hope um, that, especially as we build out. Uh, our component uh, of education in the Americas, uh, 100,000 strong, uh, that we will be able to um, begin to, to build a, a larger uh, U.S. presence uh, in Brazilian universities. Uh, but in order to do that successfully, uh, we need the help of Brazilian universities um, because many Brazilian universities are not equipped to take international students easily. They don't have dormitories. They don't have international student programs. And so it tends to fall to the student uh, to find a place to live, uh, networks of uh, support networks, uh, et cetera, et cetera. To, and, and some young students are very good at that, um, but, but others aren't. Others want kind of a, a more package deal. Uh, and there are a few Brazilian universities that are beginning to understand this and are beginning to try to fashion um, mechanisms that will allow them to attract uh, foreign students more easily, and not just from the United States, but, but from elsewhere. Uh, and, and one of the things that, that we hope to be able to do over time with the Science Without Borders program is use what is really a student exchange program to build relationships between institutions, between universities, and to use that to facilitate the movement of faculty, to facilitate movement of services, and eventually to break down the, um, uh, the closed shop nature of universities, especially when it comes to things like credits and, and degrees. Uh, so that they can be shared easily. Now, this is a long-term vision, but, but it, is, it is really our hope over time um, to take a program which is really just about exchanging students and use it to build relationships between our educational systems uh, and our laboratories and research institutes uh, that are, are going to be, uh, provide a, uh, a much more vigorous and, and I think productive relationship for, for both countries. Uh, in, in terms of disclosure problems, challenges, crises, outrage, um, I mean, you picked a word. Um, you're right. I choose my words carefully. Uh, uh, because, I mean, I, I, again, I mean, we could call it something else. You could just call it treason. Uh, but, um, um, but that focuses on Snowden as opposed to I agree. I agree. I agree. I agree. But, um, uh, but, but I, I, again, what, what I, what I – what I, what I want to be able to do here is, is recognize uh, the seriousness of the issue, recognize the impact that it's had on the relationship, and especially on Brazil's understanding of, of that relationship, um, but put it in, into a context uh, in which it doesn't overwhelm that relationship, because I don't think it should. Uh, I mean, obviously, it, it raises uh, issues, and the imagery is different. Um, uh, when Antonio Patriota was foreign minister, he said it cast a dark shadow on the relationship, and, and others have used uh, words uh, like trust and respect. Um, and obviously, we're going to have to address all that in, in some fashion. Um, but at the same time, um, I believe that the Brazil end of this has been exaggerated uh, for political purposes, not by Brazilians themselves, but by Snowden's handlers. Uh, I believe that it, much of it has been taken out of context. Uh, and, and I believe that, uh, that ultimately um, we are in a position with the Brazilians uh, because of this 
first of all, to rethink our intelligence liaison relationships, uh, because that's something Brazil does very poorly right now, um, largely because of their own internal history and, and because of, of the relative um, uh, smallness of its intelligence services. Uh, but a recognition that Brazil, Brazil does not have an intelligence service that matches its global ambitions. And that in order to do that, it really needs to build liaison relationships uh, with global intelligence services that are, are capable of helping it uh, do the kinds of things and, and provide the kinds of services to its own government that ultimately it's going to need. Uh, Brazil is in a privileged place right now. Uh, it largely does not have external enemies. It does have adversaries. It does have people that are very interested in what's happening inside Brazil. Um, uh, and, and it is uh, the, the, the subject and the object of, of cyber assault every day. And, and, uh, and Brazilians know this. Uh, and, and so they're looking for ways to, to build a capacity as they, as they build out their, their, um, their economy. And uh, it's our hope that uh, they will recognize that, that they have a useful partner in us and that they need to, 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 to see beyond their own the immediate concerns caused by Snowden to, to build out that partnership, especially as they look towards the, the World Cup and, and, and the Olympics. Um, but also, um, as I noted and, and, and as I think you acknowledged, um, this is much bigger than intelligence issues. This is really about how a modern society uh, manages the kind of data that is flowing through our telecommunication systems and our information hubs. Uh, and it's going to require uh, a response uh, that is, or, or at least a, a, a thought process that is much larger than the one we have going right now. Thank you. Ali? Alec Watson from uh, Hills and Company. Thank you very much for a really a brilliant exposition, Tom, earlier on. I, uh, Paulo, uh, anticipate a little bit what I'd like to ask you about. Um, the there are in indications in Brazil that Brazilians are starting to feel a little bit isolated uh, in international commerce and the trade issues with the formation of the Pacific Alliance, the TPP negotiations, the, U the TTIP negotiations and others. Um, and the comments by the CNI president in Denver uh, reflect some of that. On the other hand, the Brazilians seem to still be hogtied by their participation in Mercosur and by certain kinds of of uh, barriers within their own still quite protectionist uh, society to be able to make a breakthrough on trade issues. They've been talking with the EU for many, many years and haven't gotten very far on that. Yet I think that is one of the points that will be most uh, important for strengthening the overall bilateral relationship yeah. between us and, uh, and the Brazilians. And I wonder if you could <coughs> say a few words about that. Well, we want more trade. Um, uh, we want more investment. Uh, that's why Brazil is one of the focuses of the President's National Export Initiative. It's why it's one of the focuses of the Select USA Initiative designed to bring investment uh, from overseas to the United States. Uh, and we're prepared to go to great lengths uh, to achieve that. And, you know, what's heartening uh, is, as, as Tony mentioned, the, uh, the, the very strong push uh, from large industrial confederations like CNI uh, on the, the bilateral trade relationship and on trying to find ways uh, to overcome uh, aspects of, of Brazilian trade and commerce, especially their historic market reserve policies, uh, that, that have limited uh, our ability to penetrate certain markets. Uh, and I think in this regard, the, uh, uh, the negotiations that are ongoing uh, between Brazil and the European Union are an interesting bellwether because uh, uh, I think it's increasingly clear uh, to Brazilians uh, that they have large opportunities in Europe, um, but they're being held back for a variety of reasons, some of them domestic and some of them related to their Mercosur relationships. And obviously, you know, we're not calling on anybody to abandon their alliances or their relationship stru trading structures. This is up to each country to make these decisions. Um, but a, r a relationship between Brazil and the European Union um, could put someone in a position where you could imagine a triangulation you know, as the United States builds its transatlantic trade partnership, um, triangulate, triangulating into South America or into the free trade agreements that exist in, in South America or into the kind of agreements one might fashion with Brazil would be a very interesting possibility and one that, that I think uh, would create a uh, kind of a fascinating uh, grouping of, of markets 
as we look across uh, into Africa and also into, into, into Asia. Um, but, um, you know, Brazil has, has come a long way in a fairly short period of time, you know, and uh, when I was there the first time around, um, from 1989 to 1992, um, you know, the thought uh, that Brazil would be the home of major global companies uh, and that it would be a, a growing investor in the United States and that a company like Odebrecht uh, would have numerous subsidiaries in, uh, uh, operating in the United States uh, and that Embraer was going to be a major supplier of regional aircraft uh, really didn't cross many people's minds. Um, uh, and so in, in a very short period of time, they've, they've covered a lot of ground, but, but they've got a lot more ground to cover. Yeah, Ambassador, if you allow, just one information. I was recently at a Council on Foreign Relations uh, conference on Brazil in New York where Minister Pimentel of Development was speaking, and he said something very meaningful to me, and I think I will repeat it here because it helps with the context. He said that Brazil, over the past 30 years or so, uh, faced and basically built a consensus internally over three major challenges. The first was democracy, followed by the challenge around st economic stabilization. There's no consensus in Brazil. Don't don't put in, don't try inflation on Brazilians because uh, you will lose. Uh, and the third is social inclusion. Brazil has achieved a lot. This in this expansion of the middle class. And then the minister added, now it's the time to face the challenge of competitiveness. And the challenge of competitiveness, the, 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 the other name of it is the challenge of making the Brazilian economy a more open economy. We, you cannot deal with competitiveness in a closed economy, as you cannot resolve innovation issues, become more innovative in a closed economy. So I just wanted to to add this because I think it's relevant to the conversation. Uh, Harriet. Uh, my name is Hattie Babin, and, and my question is related a bit to what Paula was just talking about, which is how does the um, recent uh, decrease in GDP and the increase in economic concerns in Brazil affect this relationship that you've come to talk to us about and help us understand? Listen, I, th I think it's indicative of, of um, the, the changes that are going on in Brazil and the challenges that, that Brazil faces. I mean, if, if you look at, at uh, what Brazil has been able to accomplish, uh, it's done a lot of this uh, on a, um, a consumer-driven growth model. Uh, and that model has kind of run its course. Uh, and Brazil now needs to build a growth model that is based on productivity and competitiveness, as, as Paulo noted. Um, and you know, as, as you look out uh, over the Brazilian landscape, you know, what's striking, at least what was striking to me, uh, is that uh, the, the challenges the Brazilian economy faces are, are several. Uh, the biggest and, and most pressing is infrastructure. Uh, in other words, how do you build the, the ports, the, the highways, the railways, um, uh, and, and the telecommunication systems that you need uh, to move goods and services. Uh, and and how, do, how do you do it in timely fashion? I mean, Brazil is the second largest food exporter in the world, but it still can't get all its product to market. It still can't get all its product to port, and it still can't get all its product to the, the foreign destinations that would happily buy Brazilian product. Uh, so it, it uh, has uh, a huge infrastructure needs that, that have to be addressed. Uh, it has uh, significant human resource uh, needs that have to be addressed as it builds out the managerial core and, and the, uh, uh, the worker core that it needs uh, to, to fashion a, a 21st century economy. Uh, and then, of course, it has uh, a regulatory drag on it, uh, whether it be in its, its labor regime, its tax structures, or the other um, uh, regulations and rules that uh, determine how you um, uh, start businesses, and more importantly, how you end close businesses. Uh, but but these aren't um, problems that are um, that are hidden or unknown. The Brazilians understand this well, and they've got a, an advanced dialogue on on how to address them. In many ways, the the infrastructure uh, uh, issues and the human resource issues are the easiest ones to resolve because they involve in investment, uh, whereas the regulatory uh, drag is the hardest because it's political. 
uh, and it involves taking on uh, significant entrenched interest within Brazilian society. Uh, and in some ways, President Rousseff uh, has inherited uh, a, um, the toughest part of Brazil's economic transformation. You know, and, you know Fernando Henrique Cardoso um, kind of cleared the space fiscally and, and, and monetarily for uh, a long-term positive growth path. Uh, and President Lula was able, through his social programs, to inject the capital into the system uh, so that Brazilians could take advantage of that long-term growth path and, and profit from it uh, and drive growth rates that were quite high. Um, but uh, President Rousseff um, took over this model uh, just as it was kind of hitting a wall. And so it's really up to her to find you know, a, 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 new, a new way to to uh, address the, the, the challenges in the Brazilian economy. So in many ways, her, her challenge is, is probably the toughest of the three. Uh, but, um, uh, but the good thing is, is, is that as, this has, as Brazil has worked through these, these, these different uh, uh, parts of its economic development, uh, it has globalized and it's become you know, very aware of what's happening elsewhere in the world. And, and so uh, I, I do think that um, uh, Brazil, is up to these challenges. The question is, is really how fast. And in this regard, you know, Brazil is uniquely positioned because there are very few countries in the world uh, whose economic well-being is entirely in their own hands. Uh, and I, I think for the most part that's true for Brazil. In other words, the decision it makes on infrastructure development, on, on education and human resources, and on regulatory reform will determine how fast it grows. If it makes the right decisions quickly, it grows faster uh, and, and stronger. If it makes them more slowly or in a haphazard fashion, it grows more slowly. The thing is, it doesn't stop growing, <laughs> and it doesn't stop being more, it, it, it it's continues to be attractive to American investors and American businesses. Well, let me come to this side of the room, Embajadora Aki, por favor. Uh, my name is Graciela Reyes. I'm a former representative of Uruguay to the Organization of American States, now an independent scholar. Um, Ambassador Shannon has mentioned a couple of times the UN resolution of the General Assembly taken yesterday, mm -hmm. presented by Brazil and Germany, and also it was sponsored by many other countries on the right of digital privacy and related to human rights. How do you see the implementation of the resolution? And will it really, if something that Brazil had fought a lot for, will it have a direct impact in the st actual state of the relationship? Uh, as I noted, uh, we joined consensus on that, um, which means that we're fine with it. Um, and the reason we were able to join consensus uh, is that the original texts that were proposed uh, by the, uh, uh, the initial conveners or, or those who offered the text, which included Brazil, um, had to change some aspects of, of that text uh, to broadly address our concerns. But, um, but, but we recognize uh, as the resolution does, uh, the importance of privacy uh, and, and the importance of uh, an Internet which is seen as a, a, a global public good and one that, that needs to be protected. Um, you know, like, like so many UN resolutions, um, these are designed to capture a sense of the members of, of the UN uh, and to help provide direction, um, but uh, they're not binding um, and, and rarely uh, do they have uh, aspects to them that are, are implemented? Um, but that doesn't mean they're not important because they, they capture a, a, a political moment and uh, uh, a, a, a purpose that, that needs to be understood and, and respected. And uh, we just think the fact that, that we were able to work uh, with our other partners, but also with Brazil, to fashion a, a text that, that we could accept uh, uh, was, was important. And, and I think it shows that whatever Brazil's intentions might have been when it started that process, uh, it recognized early on that it wasn't going to achieve everything it wanted to in that process, and it, and it had to, to, uh, to make concessions that actually created a, a better environment for, for the kind of dialogue that, that we're having. Cindy. <coughs> Thanks. Cindy Arnson with the Latin American program here. Thank you very much for your, uh, for your remarks. Um, my question has to do with Brazil's relationship with other countries um, in the hemisphere, whether South America or more broadly. Um, there, I think, we and Paolo and I have worked on some of this together, there's 
broad respect for um, the strength of the Brazilian economy, what Brazil has accomplished in, in terms of democracy. I think there's less willingness to cede leadership um, in the hemisphere um, you know, to Brazil, even though Brazil aspires to use South America as a base for, for global projection. Um, and you see any number of examples, you know, Mexico's staunch you know, opposition to having uh, Brazil have a permanent seat on the UN Security Council. Um, you see it in the reaction in the hemisphere to the position that Brazil took vis-a-vis -vis reform of the inter-American human rights system. And, and so I was wondering, in your time as ambassador, if you could, if you could comment on how you um, perceived Brazil's leadership <coughs> being perceived um, in uh, other parts of the region. That's a great question. Um, and my, my own experience is, is that, you know, Brazil tries to be very, very careful in terms of, of how it deals with its neighbors, um, largely because it, it recognizes that its, its, its bigger ambitions, which are expressed through UNASUR and, to a certain extent, CELAC, but especially UNASUR, that its larger South American ambition um, has to be managed with uh, respect and understanding for the concerns of other countries. Uh, and it consistently tries to present itself not as a hegemonic force, but as a, a coalescing force uh, in, the, in the region. This is not easy when you're as big as Brazil and when you border on every country except Chile and Ecuador. Uh, as the Brazilians like to point out, they even border on France um, through, through French Equatorial Guinea. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, it, it's, uh, uh, it's a complicated diplomatic dance, and it, it's made more complicated by, by Mercosur relationships, obviously, and uh, the, the trade challenges that Brazil faces with, with Argentina, uh, because they tend to overload some of the circuits in, in the relationship and the, the structures that they have. Um, but, uh, but the Brazilians work very hard at this. Uh, but in many ways, you know, the, um, uh, well, well, first of all, I mean, the, um, the efforts to fashion regional uh, integration units are, uh, from our point of view, are positive. Whether it's UNASUR, whether it's uh, SICA in Central America, whether it's the Caribbean community, um, these are all efforts that, that facilitate dialogue and facilitate exchanges that, that are ultimately a for the, the well-being of, of the subregions and, and, the, and the broader hemisphere. Um, but uh, but, but the, actually, the, the biggest impediment uh, to a Brazil that dominates South America is its in, largely its inability to open its markets. <coughs> uh, if, if Brazil could open its markets, um, the Andean countries never would have done free trade agreements with the United States, or at least not with the speed that they did them. Uh, mm. they, they would have done agreements with, with Brazil. Uh, and, um, you know, when, um, when the Mexicans realized that they had been organized out of Latin America and they weren't part of SICA, they weren't part of the Caribbean community, they weren't part of UNASUR, and so they launched their own initiative, CELAC, um, that was all about putting themselves back into the region. But in some ways, the most daring and interesting diplomatic move uh, of recent times has been Mexico's um, joining the Pacific Alliance. Uh, because it's put Mexico into South America uh, in a way that uh, I think many never anticipated uh, and created the possibility of a, of a connected series of, of free markets along the Pacific coast all facing Asia without a U.S. presence or a driving uh, purpose um, that, that I think uh, ultimately will be uh, uh, challenges the wrong word because, you know, Brazil tends to address problems by embracing them. Um, and, and so um, I, I don't think this is a, a challenge to, to Brazil uh, so much as, as it is something that, that it has to understand and, and address in, in a way that reflects the interests and concerns of, of those the members of the alliance. Yeah. Yes, the gentleman, yes. Uh, <coughs> I'll answer your question. Yeah. Then I'll come. My name is Steve Schwadron. I'm here on behalf of the U.S. Travel Association, and I want to thank you for your opening remarks about the booming demand in, uh, in, in both directions, for both business travel and, uh, and leisure travel. Um, and in that context, I think it should be mentioned how commendable it is the, the enormous effort that the embassy has made over the last year or two to bring down uh, really alarming delays uh, in, uh, in wait times 
for uh, uh, Brazilian applicants for U.S. visas. Remarkable progress has been made, as you know. Uh, those wait times are down over 90 percent, and it makes a big difference. Um, <coughs> that demand, we all hope and expect, will continue to rise. And in that context, I wanted to bring up the question of the visa waiver program. Um, as you, I'm sure, are aware, this spring, uh, the first South American country, will, uh, Chile, will be admitted to the program. Um, a year and a half ago, after, the, after President Obama was in Brazil, working groups between the two, to the two uh, State Departments were established to set up so-called roadmaps, pre-discussions, knowing that the conditions aren't yet in place uh, for, a, for an actual agreement, but to, to lay the groundwork for that. Um, it's not clear to many of us where that all stands, and particularly after October. And I wonder if you can, uh, in, the, in the spirit of looking forward and consensus that you've described here, uh, describe what the path forward may be there. Sure. No, happy to, happy to do that. Um, you know, um, a, as we try to understand the demographics in Brazil and try to understand better what's been driving this tremendous surge in visas, obviously the growth of the middle class was seen immediately as, as one of the reasons why we were seeing such a, a sharp rise. But as, as we looked at, at the issue more closely, we realized that really wasn't true. Um, because many of the, the new middle class uh, entrants were not traveling to the United States. They were still traveling inside Brazil. And that what we were seeing was increased travel uh, by upper middle class. Uh, and um, because of they had more disposable income. Uh, and they had developed an, an interest in travel. And even though we had to run really hard, as you mentioned, in order to, to fashion a, a visa processes that reduced wait times from 120 days to two days uh, and accommodated the many Brazilians who were traveling to the United States, um, we recognize that there is a whole new group of entrants into the middle class that have yet to, to attempt to travel to the United States, but that they're coming. And it's kind of like a rogue wave out there. We know, we know it's somewhere in the middle of the ocean, and we know it's not stopping. Uh, and we have, uh, through our new consulates, through expanding our, um, uh, our consular sections and the number of officers we have and building out the, the interviewing windows we have, we are building a capacity uh, to produce 1.8 to 2 million visas a year. Right now we're doing about 1.3 million visas a year. Um, but I personally don't think that's enough if this rogue wave keeps coming at us. Uh, and we could find ourselves back in a near crisis situation in the next couple of years, especially if the Brazilian economy uh, picks up um, in, in terms of growth. Uh, and if this, the new, new entrants into the middle class are able to consolidate themselves in, in the middle class. And that's where a visa waiver program uh, becomes very important. And it's one of the reasons why both countries uh, have to keep working at it. There was real hesitancy on the part of the Brazilian government to address uh, the visa waiver program. Uh, first of all, because their experience uh, in Spain and Portugal has not been a happy one, and they end up having people turned around at ports of entry. Uh, and it's much, it's much better to have people denied a visa in Rio, Sao Paulo, Recife, than to have them be told in Miami or Los Angeles or New York that they're not coming in with their families, that they have to turn around and go back. And so there was, they're, they're, the Brazilians were looking for assurances that they weren't going to, you know, um, repeat the experiences that they'd had in, in Lisbon and Madrid. Um, um, and, and, but also, um, you know, visa waiver programs like global entry programs and, and, and other uh, measures that are designed to facilitate travel um, uh, have a security component to them. Uh, and it's not that we uh, ask people for information on travelers. We don't. Um, but we do um, want governments to give us a thumbs up or a thumbs down on people, in other words, whether they're risks or not, based on information available to national governments. Uh, and, 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 and this is very hard for the Brazilians to do legally um, because uh, it, it, it requires them um, to, um, first of all, to dig through databases that are not easily connected right now. Uh, but, but secondly, um, um, uh, to share risk assessments um, that they, they, they doubt they are legally um, allowed to do. So we, we think there's a way forward on this. We, we, we think we can, we can solve these problems. Um, but it's, it's going to take uh, 
uh, some hard work on, on both sides, but we think there's some urgency to, to it. Okay, uh, at the center here, Carl. I'm getting there, I'm getting there. Hey, thanks, this is Patrick Pindaro with Frontier Strategy Group. I work with many multinationals operating in Brazil, and for them, the cost of doing business is quite high. And it can be a lot higher than Brazilian firms doing business there, largely due to a lot of the cheap credit that's available through the Bini Days and other measures, knowing the local tax regimes and, and where to set up local production. Which ways does the U.S. plan to advocate for these U.S.-based multinationals on making it easier and, and facilitating the process of doing business in Brazil so the return on investment's not like a five or seven year time frame or 10 years plus? Yeah, well, you know, the, the famous Brazil cost affects everybody. It's, it's not just, you know, people who are coming in from the outside. Well, one of the, one of the striking things about uh, Bani de Esse is that, that they'll lend to American companies if you're based in Brazil. Um, uh, but, um, but without a doubt, as I mentioned, uh, there, there is an overhang in the economy that, that, that needs to be addressed to, to, to promote not just Brazilian companies from helping generate increased growth, but, but also the growing presence of, of global companies and, and global investors. Uh, and, and some of this, of course, has to do with the regulatory costs and the legal costs. Uh, and, and to the extent possible, I mean, we're, um, I mean we've got a, a very uh, large, by our standards, foreign commercial service presence in Brazil uh, and, and a very skilled one uh, that operates out of all of our, our consulates and our embassy now and is prepared to, to help all American companies that, that are interested. Um, you know, many of the multinationals come down, uh, you know, with their own resources and can, can manage their way through a lot of this, but, but, but many companies are coming in fresh. And uh, we're, we're especially seeing w with companies that come down, say, with uh, uh, state delegations led by governors, is a great interest in either selling into the market or being present, but, but very little understanding of, of how to do it. And, and that's where I think we can, we can play an important role because we can facilitate contacts and, and try, to, try to look for, for Brazilian partners. Um, be because ultimately, um, uh, Brazil is a country where uh, the extent to which uh, you have Brazilian partners working with you, it's going it, to make it a lot, a lot easier. Um, but the, the advice we give to American companies when they come down uh, is, uh, first and foremost, a, a take on, on Tom Jobim's famous dictum that Brazil uh, is, is not for beginners, uh, that it's a complex and complicated country. Uh, and in many ways, it's like an archaeological dig in the sense that its laws and regulations and codes never seem to go away. They just build one on top of another. Uh, and, and, and navigating that is, is, can be challenging for, for some businesses. But also, uh, and, and this is not from Tom Jobim, it's from Tom Shannon, uh, Brazil is not for short timers. It's not for hot money. It's not for people who are gonna come in and come out. It's for people who are prepared to make a long-term commitment, um, uh, simply because it does take a long time to establish yourself and, and to find, find a, a way forward. And, and we believe that uh, you know, given the direction that Brazil is going, given uh, the size of its domestic market, and, and given the, the platform that it could be, uh, for exports into the region and beyond, uh, it, it is attractive to American industries. But, uh, but again, um, we've, you know, uh, we have very clear instructions uh, from the President and from uh, the Secretary of State and the Secretary of Commerce you know, that our, our number one priority is commercial diplomacy. Uh, and so um, uh, this was my priority. I'm sure it's Liliana Ayalde's priority as the new ambassador to Brazil. Uh, so, um, um, although I'm not there now, I would just recommend that, that you work very closely with, with the embassy and our consulates because we'll provide all the help we can. John Paul. Yes, uh, Paul, Paul Johnson. Um, thank you so much for putting this together, Paulo, and uh, Ambassador Shannon, good to, uh, always a pleasure to hear you uh, talk. Um, we've heard um, over the years about opportunities for trilateral cooperation between the United States and Brazil and Africa, in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, what are the prospects for um, some meat on that uh, bones in terms of, uh, you know, trade, investment, financing, um, industries like agriculture, infrastructure, uh, health? Um, just wanted to hear your thoughts on that. Thank you. No, thank you. It's great seeing you. Um, uh, th there's lots of possibilities. Uh, in, in fact, on, on the foreign assistance side, uh, we began our trilateral cooperation uh, in Sao Tome Principe in an effort to eradicate malaria. 
uh, but I've extended that uh, to Mozambique where we're doing some really important work on the public health side and also on the agricultural productivity side. Uh, but we're also uh, working with the Brazilians in Honduras uh, and in Haiti on agricultural productivity and, uh, and, and some, some, some other projects. Uh, and, and this is brand new for us and it's brand new for the Brazilians and working through the Brazilian Cooperation Agency, uh, ABC, uh, has, has really been a, an, an interesting and, and fruitful experience. Um, it's a small agency. Um, it's staffed largely out of Itamarachi. Brazil still doesn't have the cadres of development professionals um, uh, uh, you know, that, that one would imagine in that kind of an agency, but it's building them over time. And, and we've created uh, an interesting relationship between USAID and ABC, where we've exchanged officers, and USAID officers have sat in ABC, and ABC officers have sat in USAID, as we try to get a better feel for for how uh, both sides work and, and where there might be synergies and, and connections. Uh, and and we're, we're quite interested and excited about um, you know, extending that possibility because we think that, that Brazil, especially on the agricultural side and on the public health care side, has some really interesting things to offer uh, countries in, in Africa and, and elsewhere. Um, Brazil does have some um, legal uh, restraints or, or constraints on, on how far it goes in, in this kind of cooperation, especially related to how monies flow back and forth between the federal government and, and ABC and, and also how it does its development assistance abroad. And so in some instances, it's really AID that is paying for uh, Brazilian services uh, in, um, in some of these countries. Uh, but we think over time, as, as Brazil uh, builds out its, its development assistance programs, uh, it's going to begin removing uh, these barriers or, or streamlining them in a way in which uh, ABC and the Brazilian government can, can do more. And on the uh, trilateral assistance around businesses, uh, Exim Bank has been in discussions with Banda de Ese about joint financing of projects, uh, especially where there's a U.S. and a Brazilian partner. Uh, and, and although, again, it's complicated to a certain extent by legal structures and rules and regulations, um, we, we continue to try to find a way forward on that because it, the potential is huge. Paolo, I might just add that uh, in the uh, outside, the private sector and government, uh, the Gates Foundation has engaged with the Brazilian government, the Ministry of uh, Agriculture, ABC, and uh, Embrapa, in a program, uh, ambitious program, to send uh, retired, distinguished ag uh, agricultural scientists uh, and economists to help with small <coughs> farms in Africa, <coughs> development of small farms and farm practices in Africa, a very uh, promising effort. Thank you. Uh, Margaret. Thank you very much. I'm Margaret Hayes, and I was one of those Brazilianistas that uh, were brought up a, a long time ago. <laughs> um, uh, when I first went to Brazil in the 1970s, um, one of the uh, points of attrition between the United States and Brazil was this nuclear question. Um, uh, more recently, and you mentioned the kerfuffle with Iran and the Lula administration and so forth. And my question is, um, have we gotten over that uh, previous, that last um, irritation? And is the Tlatelolco Treaty of the South American countries possibly a model for the kind of uh, weapons nonproliferation regime that we are looking at in uh, Middle East and other areas? Is this an area where we might see more cooperation? Yeah. Um, I mean, we are way over Iran. <laughs> um, uh, we got over that one pretty quickly, actually. Uh, and and, and I, I think that, you know, Brazil has been a very useful partner, you know. Um, although Brazil is never happy with sanctioned regimes, it, uh, it uh, complies with them uh, and uh, faithfully. Uh, and... Uh, uh, but but more importantly, um, you know, it. Um, I, I think that, that especially under President Rousseff, uh, uh, the Brazilians have made clear that uh, that Iran had a lot of explaining to do, and and that if it wanted to have normal relationships, um, it was going to have to be respectful uh, of UN Security Council resolutions and and the desire um, 
expressed repeatedly by the Security Council and elsewhere uh, that Iran address the concerns related to its nuclear program. Uh, and, and, and Brazil has also been supportive publicly, uh, you know, most recently of the agreement that the P5 plus 1 was able to, to fashion uh, with, with Iran, and I think Brazil sees this as a, as a very positive development. So that's, that's helpful. Uh, so I, I think in that regard, we're, we're in a very good place um, uh, right now. As regard to Tlatelolco, I mean, obviously, the, the, the Latin American experience, you know, around nuclear proliferation and especially the agreement between Brazil and Argentina to end their weaponization programs and to create um, kind of mutual um, verification capabilities uh, was uh, an innovative and in, an important uh, agreement and, and one that could be useful as we look at, at how we manage verification regimes elsewhere. Uh, the, um, but, but I think ultimately the, the challenge we're going to face, whether it's in Iran or North Korea, you name it, uh, is really, uh, uh, it's going to really be about verification. Uh, and, and in, in, in that regard, um, oddly enough, this is where intelligence is going to play a very important role. Uh, because what we have seen over time is that, especially in the non nonproliferation side, uh, intelligence uh, is central to how we do our verification work. Um, because while much of it can be done publicly and much of it can be done by, by inspectors, not all of it can be. Um, so um, as, we, as we think about um, uh, the issues raised uh, by, by Mr. Snowden, we need to understand that that not all of it is about spying on countries um, for immediate benefit. Um, much of it has to do with, with supporting larger international agreements. Yes, right, right there, the lady there, yes. Christina Cerna uh, with Georgetown University Law Center. Thank you uh, for your talk, but even more so for taking so many questions. I have two questions. One is um, if you could shed some light on why uh, President Obama apologized to Angela Merkel but not to Dilma Rousseff for uh, the spying. Um, and secondly, um, unexpected, maybe counterintuitive, magnanimous gestures have worked extremely well for the Pope, for example. And pres President Putin is reportedly considering a pardon for the Pussy Riot um, girls and also the Arctic Sunrise crew. Uh, would you consider recommending to the government um, a pardon for Snowden, given that it, he's such a thorn in our relations with so many countries, but particularly Brazil and America? Yeah. Oh, th thank you uh, for, for both of those questions. Um, you know, uh, when when, when these issues uh, first appeared, uh, and especially when the allegations of, of head of government uh, surveillance uh, appeared, uh, we treated the Brazilians in the same way we treated the Germans, uh, which was quite remarkable uh, given what other allegations were out there. Um, and. Uh, the Brazilians understood this and uh, I, I think appreciated it in their own way because it was indicative of, of the importance of the relationship. Uh, although our intelligence liaison relationships with both countries are quite different. Uh, Germany has uh, much more equity uh, in our intelligence community than Brazil does. Um, and especially with uh, troops participating in ISAF uh, because much of the force protection intelligence comes from U.S. sources. Uh, and, um, but uh, again, I, I don't want to get into characterizing um, the, um, the conversation that President Obama had with, um, with the Chancellor. Um, I'll, I'll leave that uh, to the White House. The, the Germans have characterized it in one fashion. I'm not sure the White House would agree with that. But, um, uh, but, but what's important is that uh, there has been communication uh, at several times uh, between President Obama and President Rousseff about this, and there will be communication uh, in the future uh, that, uh, that addresses that specific issue. Um, and, and so I, I think that given the circumstances, we're, um, 
we're probably about in as good a position as we could possibly be in terms of of how we we do our leader to leader engagement and our country to country engagement. In terms of unexpected actions, um, you know, um, uh, this was raised briefly in a 60 Minutes piece uh, on the NSA, uh, and. Uh, I think it's it's clear, you know, both from the uh, uh, what the White House has said, uh, but especially um, from what our Department of Justice has said, that um, you should not expect an unexpected gesture. Yes, at the very yeah, let me collect a few questions, and because we are coming to an end now, uh, Carol, up there we have two, and then we have Jose Miguel, hi, and then that's it. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, hi, I'm John Pilar. Like you, I've served twice in Brazil, but with USAID. Um, and you've talked a bit about bilateral cooperation and opportunities. Uh, you talked more about trilateral. Um, you mentioned the, uh, the opportunities in education, and of course, we've had major successes uh, from the early 70s where we had institution building projects with Brazil, linking American and Brazilian universities, sending dozens of Brazilians for masters and PhD training and then they've come back and now they're running those institutions in agriculture and health and other areas. Uh, you alluded to agriculture, uh, wondering about energy, environment, uh, both infectious and endemic diseases. What opportunities to buy for bilateral cooperation do you see? Okay, uh, let's move to the next question. Yes, there. Okay. Welby Lehman from the House Ways and Means Committee. Um, in Bali, we saw a great success uh, at, at the WTO, led, it, led very ably by a Brazilian director general. Um, up until right before that success was cinched, uh, it looked as though some of the uh, WTO players with which Brazil has most aligned itself over the years would be the reason for the failure of uh, the Bali um, uh, discussions. To what degree coming out of Bali do you think that, in fact, Brazil's view of its own geoeconomic and specifically trade leadership is changing from one in which it's a leader of the developing world to one in which it's a broker of some sort between the developing world and the developed world? Yes, let's come here. Oh, no, let's start with the, disculpe, Jose Miguel. Okay. <laughs> uh, Jose Miguel Luanco, Human Rights Watch. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you very much, Ambassador Shannon, for your remarks. Um, you mentioned that um, you hope to build up um, um, a, a constructive relationship with Brazil, uh, promoting common values like uh, democracy and human rights. Um, what makes you feel um, hopeful, I wouldn't say optimistic, but uh, that uh, that kind of partnership could be developed and could be effectively developed in our region? In specifically in South America, where um, there is a group of countries, uh, particularly the ALBA countries, that uh, I don't think they share the same views and the same values in terms of promotion of democracy and human rights. Uh, it's critical that Brazil plays a, a more visible role, more effective role. And um, um, how do you see that role developing in terms of uh, um, working together constructively with? Uh, with the U.S. government in, in South America. Thank you. And last question, please. Hi, B Bob Kaplan from the Inter-American Foundation. I don't actually think you'll have uh, time to answer my, my question, so uh, I'll just pose it perhaps as a, as a comment. It's been really wonderful to hear your remarks on a whole range of uh, subjects uh, across the breadth of, of, of Brazil issues. But Brazil, as you said, is a continental country. So I was uh, wanting to ask if you could comment a bit on some of the tensions uh, within the country and so that come along with uh, improvements in social inclusion and, and, and growth and improvements in, in economic well-being across the country, within the country, instead of treating Brazil as a single country that's uh, doing remarkable things, what's happening in the different regions of the country which are affected differentially and are uh, have differential opportunities? Okay, well, thank you. Um, all good questions. Uh, in, in regard to USAID, AID, actually, you know, we've done something really remarkable with uh, our AID mission in, in, in Brazil because uh, it was on the chopping block, uh, as it has been, you know, several times in our history. Uh, but we were able to convince uh, our colleagues at USAID here in Washington uh, and elsewhere 
uh, that now was the time to move from an AID mission that was effectively a development mission to one that was a policy engagement mission. Uh, the idea being that as Brazil's economy expands and as it builds its own foreign assistance programs, uh, that uh, uh, we needed to be there working with them and engaging with them on a daily basis uh, with the hope of, of helping to um, influence and shape how they, how they did uh, assistance work. Uh, so that it was more compatible with what we were trying to accomplish, recognizing that uh, other major economies out there, in particular the Chinese economy, uh, have a very different understanding of what foreign assistance is. Uh, and, and so far, um, the, the dialogue has been really positive. Uh, and as I've noted, we've been able to fashion uh, third country assistance programs uh, where we're able to share expertise uh, and funding in, in order to accomplish common goals. And, and I, I think that if we're able to do this right, it, it could uh, create a, a new kind of uh, development assistance diplomacy that we could deploy in other countries that have uh, emerging or strong economies and are playing an, an increasingly important role in, in sub-regions. Um, but as we've done this, of course, we've had to, to kind of pull back on, on some of our historic uh, development roles uh, in, in Brazil, and largely our AID program today is focused uh, on, on uh, biodiversity issues and, and climate change issues. Uh, we still do some small public health issues. Uh, we've got a few alternative energy programs, um, but uh, this does not represent the future of our development assistance program. Um, however, it does represent the future of our commercial engagement and our investment uh, engagement. And what's striking for me, especially in the area of public health, is the degree to which American pharmaceutical companies are prepared to come to Brazil and are agreed uh, are prepared to do agreements with Brazilian companies to transfer significant technologies uh, and build out a capacity for um, for Brazilian pharmaceutical companies, uh, and this is largely driven by the emerging middle class and a demand for high quality health care in Brazil. Uh, so I, I I do think that that uh, the the synergies are there. It's just they're moving from the development world into the commercial and, and investment world. Uh, in regard to the WTO in Bali, um, first of all, congratulations to Roberto Acevedo, uh, who did a really wonderful job in managing what could have been a disastrous uh, event for, for the WTO. Uh, and I think it was in everybody's interest to make sure that the Bali event um, uh, was successful to the extent possible, uh, because it, having a failed WTO at this point in time uh, would, would not have, have been in, in anyone's um, uh, best interests. Uh, and especially with Acevedo at its head, I think the Brazilians felt a, a special need uh, to play uh, as much of a role of, of broker as they could. I mean, historically, Brazil has approached these kind of negotiations uh, with two mentalities. Uh, you know, one is to try to get the best deal possible, uh, but if that's not going to work, then try to assert leadership in some fashion uh, and use the event as a way to, to assert leadership. Um, uh, but I, I think in this regard, they, they recognized that they could do both. Um, they could uh, act as, as, as a leader of a particular group of countries while at the same time brokering. So I, I think they found a way to, to bridge uh, that divide. And, mm -hmm. and with any luck, they'll be able to maintain that over time. In terms of human rights, it's a great question. You know, and it's one of the big struggles um, you know, that Brazil faces as it tries to find a way to express through its foreign policy what it means to be a democracy uh, in the region and, and in the world. Because historically, you know, Brazil has been an adherent to principles of non-intervention and non-interference and self-determination of peoples and has been very reluctant uh, to criticize countries, um, uh, no matter what they're doing, um, uh, because uh, at, at one level, it doesn't believe it should, but at another level, it also has recognized that it's quite vulnerable to criticism. It does not want to open the door for reciprocal attacks uh, and wants to build a certain protection, especially with inside uh, institutional and, and regional organizations. Um, but I, I don't think that that, that is a, a stance that it will be able to maintain in the long term, simply because as Brazil globalizes and as its society globalizes, mm -hmm. Brazilians themselves are going to wonder what it means to be uh, a democracy in the world, and, and how does Brazil express that democracy? Um, and and the, the fact that, that internally you've got such a strong commitment uh, to an open society, such a strong commitment to, to individual rights, uh, is a very positive thing uh, to work from. So this is going to be a, an evolutionary process uh, over time, and it's just one we can't give up on. We just have to keep focused and pushing on it. Uh, and as regards to the tensions within the country, 
Um, you know, Brazil's a huge country, but uh, um, of all of the, the, the colonial uh, entities that, that were established in the region, it's the only one that's held together um, uh, of that size. Uh, and I'm sure there's all kinds of linguistic and, and cultural reasons for that and demographic reasons for it. Um, uh, but um, although it is a, uh, a, a big country, it is uh, it, 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 and, and, a, and a diverse country uh, in terms of its linguistics and its accents and its traditions and, and the ethnicity of its, of its immigrants, uh, at the same time, there is something that makes everyone a Brazilian. Um, and that, in many ways, is, is what's remarkable about, about Brazil. And, and although uh, even today, uh, people in the southern part of Brazil uh, will be dismissive of the northern part of Brazil, and people in the northeastern part of Brazil will be dismissive of people in the southern part of Brazil, um, one can find the same thing in the United States. Uh, and and I, I think that that's you know, what's... Uh, Remarkable about about Brazil is is that, uh, like the United States, it is able through its diversity to present an image of itself that everybody seems to understand. Everybody knows what a Brazilian is, um, and I, I just think that is a tremendous accomplishment. Well, Mr. Ambassador, thank you. I would like before close just to remind you of something, which will this was the last event of our program this year, and I'm grateful to. Ambassador Shannon to Ambassador Harrington uh, for uh, being here and help, help have participated in this. Now this Sunday marks the 25th anniversary of the assassination of Chico Mendes. Chico Mendes was not known in Brazil when he was killed mm -hmm. uh, in the state of Acre. Uh, today, Chico Mendes is honored in Brazil uh, uh, the, ins the National Institute for studies policy making in the Amazon is the Instituto Chico Mendes. Chico Mendes is one of the 26 national heroes of Brazil and so a name by the Brazilian Congress. Uh, we have associated ourselves, the Brazil Institute has too, a group of institutions that uh, will have, will host a memorial service this Sunday at 4 at the uh, holy uh, name Catholic Church on 11th Street, the announcement at our website. And uh, uh, I hope that uh, uh, those that are interested can join us there. Uh, with that, uh, I would like to thank uh, uh, Ambassador Shannon very much for being here with us. And I would like to thank you uh, for uh, uh, having been with us throughout this year. That is finish at uh, uh, closing now. Uh, we are very grateful to you. Uh, I wanted to recognize uh, especially two people that have been working uh, with me, uh, Michael Darden that was kind of overworked and left town yesterday, and uh, Ana Carolina Cardenas, our Carol, who is also working with us. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Happy New Year. And uh, uh, please, uh, I would like to recognize uh, and with gratitude uh, uh, the presence of uh, Ambassador Thomas Shannon here today. Thank you very much. Terrific job. Above your normal terrific job.